Our investigation also uncovered additional evidence that is inconsistent with someone choosing to die by suicide. In the hours leading up to Sandra's death, she reached out to a photographer to inquire about booking a newborn photo shoot. She also reached out to a friend about obtaining baby clothes. And at the time, that uh, it, she was in the middle of doing laundry when she died with a load in the washing machine and another one in the dryer. When Canton police went to Sandra Birchmore's apartment on February 4, 2021, they quickly concluded that the woman had been deceased for several days. Birchmore was found seated on the floor of her apartment with a scarf around her neck, tightly tied to a closet door handle. There were no signs of a struggle, no trauma on her head, and no defensive wounds on her hands. The office of the chief medical examiner ruled her death a self-inflicted act, citing a fractured U-shaped bone in her neck. An autopsy confirmed that she was between 8 and 10 weeks pregnant at the time of her passing. But let's pause for a moment and consider how it took a staggering three years and six months to finally arrest Matthew Farwell for Sandra Birchmore's death. Despite the suspicious circumstances Norfolk DA Michael Morrissey stated, a mere 19 months after her death, that there was no evidence of criminal intent. What kind of investigation were they running, and more importantly, what exactly were they trying to cover up? Morrissey's statement, given all that has surfaced since then, seems to reek of either gross incompetence or something far worse, corruption. Federal authorities, in court filings unsealed just this week, have reached a dramatically different conclusion from the initial investigation. According to the FBI, Sandra Birchmore was suffocated by Matthew Farwell, a former Stoughton police officer who manipulated her and began engaging in inappropriate behavior with her when she was just a teenager. The FBI affidavit suggests that Farwell staged the scene to make it look like a self-inflicted act. Now, if we take a closer look at the findings of Dr. William Smock, an expert hired to assist in the federal investigation, the inconsistencies are glaring. Smock reviewed crime scene photos, autopsy reports, and the medical examiner's findings, and his conclusions are damning. He found that the fracture in Birchmore's neck was not consistent with the position in which she was found. Instead, these types of fractures are typically seen in suffocation cases, not self-inflicted acts. The autopsy photos also revealed that Birchmore had skin missing from parts of her nose, injuries that are consistent with suffocation. Yet somehow, none of this raised any red flags in the initial investigation? Let's not forget that Birchmore was wearing a chain necklace with a flamingo pendant, which was found broken around her neck, a clear sign of a struggle. How could such crucial evidence be overlooked? Or was it deliberately ignored? Dr. Smock's conclusions that Birchmore's cause of death was asphyxia and her manner of death was homicide are supported by another expert, Dr. Michael Baden, a former chief medical examiner in New York City. Both experts reached the same conclusion, Sandra Birchmore was murdered. But the question that looms large is why it took federal authorities so long to uncover the truth? What was Morrissey and his team doing during their investigation? And more importantly, what were they hiding? Morrissey's dubious handling of this case is not an isolated incident. Let's not forget his role in the Karen Reed case, where he blatantly lied about the connections between Michael Proctor, the lead investigator, and the Alberts, a family deeply intertwined with the case. Proctor's relationship with the Alberts was downplayed, despite overwhelming evidence that should have disqualified him from any involvement in the investigation. If Morrissey was willing to lie to protect a detective in one case, why should we believe that he wouldn't do the same to protect a police officer in another? The stench of corruption is overwhelming. Even the sitting DA, the elected DA, decided to weigh in on this issue of the relationship between the Proctors and the McCabe's and or the Alberts. And he said there's no such relationship, zero, this doesn't exist. As a matter of fact, the word that he used was it's a lie. Any suggestion to the contrary that there's any kind of relationship between the Proctors and the McCabe's or the Proctors and the Alberts is a lie. His words. So the DA himself has put Trooper Proctor's neutrality at issue and he did it in the most public way possible and I would suggest a clumsy way. Who was he talking to? He didn't come into this courthouse and address the court as we've all done. He didn't address the court, he didn't address the Commonwealth, he didn't address, he is the Commonwealth, he didn't address us, the defense. What he did do is he addressed the public and the potential jurors and that was by design has been suggested proctor would have no motive to do so 
Trooper Proctor had no close personal relationship with any of the parties involved in the investigation and had no conflict. And he had no reason to step out of this investigation. Every suggestion to the contrary is a lie. This should be seen for what it is and not used as a pretext to attack and harass others. What is happening to the witnesses, some with no actual involvement in the case, is wrong. It is contrary to the American values of fairness and the constitutional value of a fair trial. It needs to stop now. He calls the evidence that we've procured and that we've presented to the court as lies. Well, let's look at those lies for a quick second. We have presented the court with photographic evidence, not something that we came up with, something they came up with. Photographs in Exhibit C in our moving papers. And I'll just cover a couple of those. There's a photograph that we presented that shows Trooper Proctor's mother, the person by the name of Colin Albert, pictured in the photograph, with Trooper Proctor's sister pictured in the photograph, with Chris Albert pictured in the photograph, and with Jennifer McCabe's own daughter, depicted in the photograph. They're all together at a birthday party. These are close and immediate family members of the Proctor family, the Albert family, and the McCabe family, and they're all together and they're socializing. That's not a lie, it's a photograph. And it's unassailable evidence of that relationship. There's a second photograph of Trooper Proctor and Colin Albert in a wedding party together. And I, I would urge the court to note, they're not at a wedding together, they're in a wedding together, in the wedding party. There's a third photograph. And Trooper when Proctor. was that? When I'm was sorry? that? When Two was that? 2012. So this relationship, as the court just noted, and I was about to get to in a second, is not just days old, months old, weeks old. This relationship is decades old between these families. There's another photograph that the court has seen, Trooper Proctor, literally on the dance floor with Colin Albert. So when counsel for Elizabeth Proctor suggests, oh no, these relationships, you can't believe any of this stuff, just because someone happens to be at the same event does not thereby establish a relationship. They weren't just at the same event. They're in a wedding party together. They're standing on the dance floor, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, Trooper Proctor and Colin Albert. And then we see a photograph of all of them seated at the same dining room table. They shared a meal together. This is socializing. These are interpersonal relationships and they can't change that. Trooper Proctor was seated at the same table, having dinner with Colin Albert, Chris Albert and Chris Albert's wife, Julie. Then there's the Facebook post, and I will leave it at this. I'm not going to go through the entirety of my motion, uh, but I would highlight the last point that I think should be highlighted for the court's attention, and that's the Facebook post. Trooper Proctor's mother refers to the Albert family as the Proctor's second family. So one might actually ask, Mr. Morrissey, who's actually lying in this case? Is it us? We just presented the court with factual information that was procured off of social media that can't, it's unassailable. It cannot be assailed. And the, the proctors have known these people for, as the court just mentioned, uh, by asking for that date for more than a decade. They've socialized with him and his family considers their family to be so close and interconnected that they are deemed a second family to the proctors. In Sandra Birchmore's case, we know that she was excited about becoming a mother. In the hours before her death, she contacted a photographer to take photos of her newborn and asked a friend about acquiring baby clothes. She even had a load of laundry in the washing machine and another in the dryer, hardly the actions of someone planning to end their life. Yet, Morrissey's investigation concluded there was no criminal intent. Are we seriously expected to believe that? Especially when video footage shows Matthew Farwell entering her apartment building and leaving shortly after, while Sandra was never seen leaving her apartment again. The inconsistencies in Morrissey's statements and the glaring omissions in the investigations he oversees should raise alarms. His insistence on downplaying or outright dismissing evidence that points to foul play suggests a pattern of protecting certain individuals while ignoring the victims. The failure to thoroughly investigate Birchmore's death, despite having all the evidence pointing towards homicide, is not just negligence, it's a miscarriage of justice. Morrissey should be investigated, not just for his role in Sandra Birchmore's case, but for the broader pattern of corruption that seems to follow his office. His actions, or rather, inactions, are a stain on the justice system. 
when those tasked with upholding the law are the very ones obstructing it, the entire system falls into disrepute. Sandra Birchmore, Karen Reed, and countless others deserve justice, and it's clear that they won't find it under Morrissey's watch. Pedestrian was struck and injured in a Rentham crosswalk where learning the driver was Canton Police Chief Helena Rafferty. A police report states the chief was driving down South Street in her town-issued SUV around 6.30 p.m. on February 16th and began to turn onto Creek Street when she hit the 67-year-old man who was wearing a yellow reflective vest and was walking with a cane. Chief Rafferty requested a breathalyzer which showed no trace of alcohol and was issued a civil citation for failing to yield to a pedestrian in a crosswalk. Rafferty explained in a statement, as I proceeded to make the left turn onto Creek Street, the vehicle lights caught the reflective vest of a person in the crosswalk. I immediately applied my brakes, but unfortunately the car made contact with him, knocking him to the ground. She expressed concern for the victim, whose attorney says he has a long road to recovery. Now, Canton police have been under widespread scrutiny over their handling of the Karen Reed murder case. Because of this, Chief Rafferty says in her statement she wishes she would have come forward about her own incident sooner. I present to you Canton police Chief Helena Rafferty, who has graciously decided to publicly acknowledge that she hit a 67-year-old pedestrian with her town-issued SUV more than a month after the incident. Yes, you heard that right. When it comes to Massachusetts police departments, cover-ups are coming in thick and fast. It's almost as if they find covering things up as easy as breathing, it's like a second nature to them. Chief Rafferty went on to say the following, and I quote, This was an unfortunate accident. Upon further reflection and considering the amount of attention that has been focused on Canton, I should have issued a statement sooner. Unquote. But here's what's so astonishing, if she had hit the man with her car and immediately owned up to it, no one would be making a big deal. Accidents do happen, and I'm sure we all would have just shrugged our shoulders and said, so what? However, the whole covering up of this incident is what raises eyebrows. During this incident, she requested to have an alcohol level test done, and it showed she was sober. Good for her for thinking quickly and getting that done as quickly as possible. Regarding the breath test, she acted like a cop. But then, soon after, she decided to keep quiet and sweep it under the rug. I have to ask myself, is thinking like a cop twice in a row too much to ask of these officers? Is good cop thinking like a glass of milk that runs out after one sip? If they make one good decision, is that it for the day? Do they have to wait like in a video game where when your life is almost depleted, you have to wait a while or do a few challenges to get more life? Is that what's happening to Massachusetts cops? Once they make a good decision, do they need about six weeks before they can muster up another one? At least she didn't crack or break her taillight when she struck the pedestrian. Goodness knows how that cover-up would have looked. Hiding this incident and not acknowledging it sooner is deeply unethical for several reasons. First, it erodes public trust. When the public cannot trust the police to be transparent and accountable, it undermines the very foundation of law enforcement. Second, it sets a dangerous precedent within the police force, suggesting that officers can evade accountability and cover up their mistakes without consequence. This is not the kind of behavior that should be tolerated in any public institution, let alone one tasked with upholding the law. We see her during Canton select board meetings, where she advocates for what is right, but then we see her do the opposite. Yet, in June this year, the board decided to renew her contract as police chief for one more year. She should be fired, not hired. This is what's wrong in Canton, people like her are getting their contracts renewed when they should be getting sacked. According to my understanding the accident was first reported by Aidan Kearney, the blogger also known as Turtle Boy. Kearney has reported extensively on the case of Karen Reed. And it seems only when Turtle Boy was shedding light on this incident did the police chief own up to what happened. What a disgrace. How can we expect these cops to do the right thing when they only do it when the wrong they did is brought to everyone's attention? And like I said, if she had come out with this when it happened, I don't think it would be a big deal. But no, these cops love covering things up. Maybe the fact that she is now being sued for $200,000 by the person she hit with the car will humble her a bit. There's nothing special about the red solo cup? Other than their uh, plastic, nothing special. And where did you get those red solo cups? Um, we got them from Lieutenant Kelleher. So in other words, you got the, 
to use your words, the evidence containers from a neighbor. Correct. Today we are revisiting the testimony of Paul Gallagher. Before we start I do want to mention Paul's ranking within the police department. He is a lieutenant, which according to my understanding means he is just under the police captain. So he is ranking quite high within the department. It's fascinating that such a high-ranking officer can be this incompetent. We are going to watch a video and see just how easy it could have been to plant evidence. What we are about to see is John O'Keefe's blood traveling in poorly secured solo cups to the Sally Port garage when in fact, it should have been at a crime scene lab in a refrigerator. We are going to see John's blood merely feet away from Karen Reed's broken tail light. Why on earth was John's blood transported to the Sally Port garage if not to plant evidence? Surely his blood isn't needed at the Sally Port garage. So if it's there then why is it there? Why is a white rag found close to the blood and the tail light? Was the rag dipped in the blood and then wiped on the tail light? During the trial, the prosecution argued that John's blood was found on the tail light. Which according to them shows that Karen hit John with her car. So let's roll the tape. There's nothing special about the red solo cup? Other than their uh, plastic, nothing special. And where did you get those red solo cups? Uh, we got them from Lieutenant Kelleher. So in other words, you got the, to use your words, the evidence containers from a neighbor. Correct. Did you go to Canton PD a mile away and get sterile swabs for the blood collection? Blood was frozen. We didn't think it would be viable. You didn't think it would be viable? Correct. If you touched the swab to cold blood, you think you might get some blood on that swab? I wasn't sure it would be efficient for testing. <clears throat> so what you did instead was you gathered red solo cups from a neighbor, unsterilized, and scooped up the snow with what you thought the blood was. We took six samples, uh, individual samples. Our philosophy was we'll let the crime lab extract it the way they best see fit. Uh, those six samples were bagged and then transported back to Kent Police Headquarters and placed into evidence. Were they covered? Uh, no, not that I recall. They weren't sealed in any way? No. So if somebody sneezed over the top of one of those cups? Uh, they, they were sealed in a bag, brown evidence bag. At that time, nobody was going to sneeze over the cup. Before you took possession of the red solo cups, do you have any idea how many people before you had handled those solo cups? I, I, I took them out of a package, so probably none. How about before they were packaged? I assume Solo doesn't sell contaminated cups. I would say none. So they're certainly not forensically stable. They're not sterile. By your, I don't know what definition you're looking for, but I would agree. Um, <clears throat> do you think it's standard practice for a police department to borrow red Solo cups from a neighbor to gather evidence? Objection. You can go ahead and answer that, Lieutenant. Of course not. You, in, you also indicated that at your direction that Sergeant Lank booked the solo cups into the evidence locker. That's procedure, yes. Right. Uh, I understand it's procedure. I'm asking if he actually did it. Yes. Okay. Did you see a log of that? Excuse me? Did you see a log of that? Um, I saw the police report. Which police report? Uh, the original um, call. Okay. Uh, and in that police report, he indicates that he took the solo cups back to Kenton Police Department and booked them into evidence, right? Uh, it was given a property number and assigned to temporary evidence. Okay. So where did those cups sit for the three days between January 29th and February 1st? In a refrigeration unit in temporary evidence. And is there a log to sign in and sign out to make sure that the chain of custody of, of uh, items like this are maintained? Uh, the evidence uh, the evidence officer keeps that log yes okay. <clears throat> is there any log lieutenant gallagher of these items being booked into the temporary evidence locker uh, there should be as far as, but i don't know for a fact but there should be yes I, I agree there should be i'm asking you if there is i don't know the answer to that the fact of the matter is there is no log or document or report ever showing that these items were ever booked into the temporary evidence locker at Canton PD. Isn't that right? Um, I don't believe that's accurate. Do you have that evidence log? I don't. I don't have access to the evidence log. 
especially um, the area right down here on the right, bottom right. You see that white rag? I do. Lieutenant, if you take a quick, uh, a close look at that rag, I'm going to ask you to identify it on the photograph. Do you see a couple of little dark marks on what appear to be that? I see it on that screen. Better visual up there. Okay. Looking at 38, does that appear to be the same rag in the photograph? It does, yes. Okay. Do you see a bag in the middle of the photograph? Yes. Can you read what's on that bag? Stop and shop. Okay. That does not look like an evidence bag, does it, sir? No. Matter of fact, it looks like a grocery bag. Correct. Is that right? Yes. So, not a forensically stable item, correct? Correct. Certainly not sterile. Correct. Right? Correct. You know where that bag came from? I do not. Was that a bag that you supplied to Sergeant Lank? Uh, I do not know. Do you not know, recall. Lank got the stop and shop bag. I do not know. Next photograph, please. 39. Taking a look at what's been marked as evidence item 39, you recognize what's in the middle of the photograph? Yes. What is that? Those are the plastic cups with the coagulated blood. Do you see on the top of the photograph the same rag? I do. With the same markings? Yes. That appear that those unsealed cups with bl liquid blood in them are situated right near the right rear quarter panel of the SUV. And this appears to be evidence item 41, I'm sorry, 40. You see the same white rag. Yes. And you see the same evidence bag, I'm sorry, stop and shop bag, correct? Correct. And it's filled with <clears throat> six solo cups. Correct with what appears to be liquid blood. Correct. So the blood inside the stop and shop bag is sitting right next to the right rear quarter panel of that truck, correct? You can see the rear tire. I, it's probably at least three feet from the rear. If you look at the top, I can use the marker here. <clears throat> this look, appears to me to be the rear tire, which would put this a couple of feet behind the vehicle. Understood. Let's give Lieutenant Paul Gallagher a big round of applause. His testimony and investigation were absolutely stellar, a true reflection of the many years of the high-quality training he's received. First, he went to Brian Albert's neighbor, who is also a cop, and asked him for a container to put blood evidence in. And what did he get? Six solo cups. I can't imagine my shock if I were faced with an incident where someone dies on my neighbor's lawn, and the cops show up asking me for a container for the victim's blood. Well, at least now I know solo cups are the way to go in such situations. Gallagher didn't find it necessary to drive a mile to the Canton Police Department for sterile swaps. Instead, he got some solo cups from a neighbor and scooped up the blood and snow with them. When Alan Jackson mentioned the potential for contamination, Gallagher was quick to correct him, saying the cups were sealed in a brown evidence bag, which we now know was a brown grocery bag. Then we find out that the solo cups never went into evidence, yet Gallagher testified under oath that he saw the police report stating they did. So, is he lying, or is the person who filled out the report lying? This is the same guy who went to a neighbor for solo cups to gather blood evidence, so it's not a far stretch to think he might be lying about the police report. Gallagher further claims the cups got an evidence log number and were placed in a refrigeration unit. When Jackson mentions there's no record of the cups ever being booked as evidence, Gallagher has the audacity to say Jackson is inaccurate. We then see in the video a white rag lying close to the brown bag, and listen closely to this portion of the clip. I think it was in this moment of the testimony that Gallagher realized the brown bag's significance when Jackson asks him about it, you can hear his voice and tone drop. Can you imagine being in his shoes, arguing about logged evidence in a refrigerator, only to suddenly see a photo of that brown grocery bag? No wonder his voice and tone changed at that moment. Jackson asked him a few questions about this bag, and Gallagher's responses became slower and softer. I could be wrong, but I wonder if he saw this evidence and these photos before his testimony. 
I'm coming to the conclusion that he didn't. I really think this is the first time he's seeing these photos, and his voice reflects that. But I could be wrong, I'm no body or voice expert. When he was asked if he supplied the stop and shop bag, his answer was very different from how he sounded before the photos of the brown bag were shown. It's like we're seeing two different Pauls, the Paul before the photo of the bag was shown and the Paul after the photo of the bag is shown. Alan Jackson then shows us what is in this brown bag and points out the location of the white rag and its distance from the taillight of Karen's SUV. Gallagher's response would be comical if it weren't so tragic. He almost argues the distance of the white rag, the solo cups with the blood, and the SUV. This response alone made my blood boil. The fact is it doesn't matter what the distance was between the rag, the solo cups, and the taillight. Those cups with that blood shouldn't have been there in the first place, they should have been in the refrigerator at the Canton Police Department. What's also astonishing is that Paul O'Keefe, the brother of John O'Keefe, is showing his full support to every officer who worked on this case. This is how they worked his brother's case, and he's happy with that and supporting it. I can tell you now, if it were my loved one who died and these officers were scooping up blood with containers they bummed off neighbors and then had that evidence placed in a grocery bag and never logged as evidence, I would be fuming. Okay, in about the next three seconds, Sergeant, I'm asking you to pay special attention to me. Go ahead. Okay. Trooper Proctor was ultimately assigned as the, what did you call him, not lead investigator, but case officer? That's correct. Did you personally, as his supervisor, did you personally respond to 34 Fairview at any point on January 29th? No, I did not. Did Trooper Proctor at your direction or on his own ever respond to 34 Fairview Road at any time on January 29th? No, he did not. Today, we're focusing on a key piece of evidence, the ring video. This video shows Karen Reed's SUV backing into John O'Keefe's car in his driveway before driving off. The defense argues that this incident explains how her taillight got damaged, it wasn't from hitting O'Keefe himself, but from hitting his car. Now, let's talk about the Massachusetts State Police. Sergeant Yuri Bukanik, who seemed to have forgotten to bring his teeth with him to court, also seemed to have forgotten to ensure that he and Officer Michael Proctor thoroughly investigated this case. I'm not usually one to comment on someone's physical appearance, but let's face it, Bukanik was Proctor's supervisor. Don't tell me he wasn't aware of Proctor's disparaging remarks about Karen. Despite Proctor being quite handy with phones, finding private photos, sending rude messages about Karen, and chatting about the gifts he'll get once this case is over, he somehow forgot to use his phone for actual police work. When Karen's vehicle was towed to the Sally Port garage, he didn't take a video of the car's condition. Seriously? In today's world, where everyone has a smartphone, not documenting the car properly is mind-blowing. It's almost like he intentionally skipped this crucial step. This raises some serious questions about the thoroughness and fairness of the investigation. Let's go back to that night. According to the Ring video, Karen Reed was backing up her SUV and lightly bumped into John O'Keefe's car. The defense argues that this is how the taillight on Reed's vehicle got damaged, not from any collision with O'Keefe himself. This small but critical detail could have major implications for understanding what actually happened. If the damage to the taillight was caused by bumping into the car and not a person, it undermines the prosecution's narrative significantly. But the situation becomes even more troubling when we consider how the evidence was handled. The vehicle was towed to the Sally Port garage, a location where a thorough and methodical inspection should have taken place. However, Officer Michael Proctor, tasked with documenting the condition of the vehicle, failed to take comprehensive video footage. This is despite the fact that he was clearly capable of using his phone for other, less professional purposes. Let's be real here. In an era where nearly everyone has a smartphone capable of capturing high-quality images and videos, failing to document the car's condition is either an astounding oversight or a deliberate act. It makes one wonder, why wasn't this crucial step taken? What were they trying to hide? Or was it just sheer incompetence? Adding to the layers of negligence, we have Proctor's superior, Sergeant Yuri Bukanik, who seemed either unaware or indifferent to Proctor's conduct. Bukanik's own apparent disregard for proper investigative procedures is concerning. 
supervisors are supposed to oversee and ensure the thoroughness of investigations. Yet, Buchanick seems to have dropped the ball entirely. His lack of attention to detail mirrors the overall mishandling of the case. It's becoming increasingly clear that the investigation was not conducted with the level of professionalism and diligence that one would expect in such a serious case. The lack of proper documentation, the failure to follow basic investigative protocols, and the unprofessional behavior of the officers involved cast a long shadow over the entire process. But let's delve deeper into the implications of this mishandling. When an investigation is conducted poorly, it doesn't just impact the immediate case, it undermines the public's trust in the entire legal system. People expect law enforcement to carry out their duties with integrity and thoroughness. When they fail to do so, it raises doubts about the legitimacy of their findings and, by extension, the outcomes of their cases. The mishandling of evidence in Karen Reed's case is a textbook example of what can go wrong when proper procedures are not followed. It leaves room for questions, doubts, and speculation, all of which can cloud the pursuit of justice. Now, imagine being in Karen Reed's position. Accused of a serious crime, she is relying on the accuracy and integrity of the investigation to clear her name. But with officers like Michael Proctor, who are more interested in sending rude messages and less interested in doing their job properly, her chances of a fair trial are significantly compromised. And let's not forget the role of technology in all of this. With the capabilities of modern smartphones, there is simply no excuse for not documenting crucial evidence. A simple video walkthrough of the vehicle could have provided clear, indisputable evidence of its condition. Instead, we are left with gaps in the narrative that only serve to benefit those who wish to obscure the truth. Additionally, there should be mandatory protocols for documenting evidence, especially in cases involving significant accusations. With technology so readily available, there is no reason why every piece of evidence cannot be thoroughly recorded and preserved. She's a whack job. What else did you say in response to, she's hot at least, or she hot at least, question mark? Uh, so following that text, uh, I responded, yeah, she's a babe, weird Fall River accent though, no ass. Yeah, she's a babe, who's the she? I miss Reed. Weird Fall River accent though, you talking about her, the way she talks? Uh, the accent. And no ass. Now you're talking about her body, her physique, correct? Yes, she's fucked. Zero chance she skates. She's fucked, right? Correct. Good, no ass bitch, right? Yes, that's what he wrote. And what did you, how did you respond to Bird saying, good, no ass bitch? I laughed. Thought that was funny, did you? Trooper Proctor? Thought that was funny? It was unprofessional of me. I sh that's something I shouldn't have done. Well, I think we all know it was unprofessional. It was a lot of things. I'm asking yep. you, did you think it was funny? No, according to my response at the time, apparently. The date is now February 2nd, 2022. And a person by the name of Doc writes, is that chick a smoke, correct? Correct. Who's the chick? A misread. And you write eh, E-H, right? Yes. And then you write nutbag, as Chief would say, correct? Correct. Who's Chief? A uh, friend of mine. And then you write what? She's got a leaky balloon knot. Trooper Proctor, explain to the jurors what a balloon knot is. Um, your, uh, essentially, I guess your rectum area. Your anus? Yes. That's what you were referring to about Miss Reed? Yes. And you were making fun of her because you believed at that time that it leaked? That's how you were treating Miss Reed? Yes or no? Yes. And then you followed that up. Just to make sure you cleared up any mistake about what you meant, you followed that up with the phrase, leaks poo, didn't you? I did.
again, another reference to Ms. Reed's medical issues and medical conditions, correct? Correct. Specifically focused on her anus, correct? In reference, yes. Were you aware at the time that you wrote this that Ms. Reed had suffered a colectomy surgery, very serious surgery? I was not, sir, no. Were you aware that she had had 10 surgeries in 18 months, several years prior? 10. I was not aware of that. Were you aware that she had serious medical issues, gastrointestinal, uh, uh, gastrointestinal medical issues that she suffered with, she was a victim of? for years. Did you know that? Objection. Sustained. But you decided that you were going to take another shot at her and talk about her anatomy. You decided that you were going to take another shot at her and talk about her anatomy as a balloon knot. Correct? Objection. Sustained. At this point, Trooper Proctor, Miss Reed was just reduced to a punchline to you, wasn't she? Objection. Sustained. <laughs>